Our state passed key legislation in 2013 to address sex trafficking in Nevada. We're examining its impact some eight years later. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. Assembly Bill 67 or AB 67 was a multifaceted bill intended to better protect victims of sex trafficking and hold their traffickers more accountable. It passed in 2013 with unanimous bipartisan support. The bill first established the crime of sex trafficking into state law. Now, prior to that, it fell under pandering. Now, more comprehensively, AB 67 broke ground in many areas, including increasing penalties for traffickers, allowing victims to receive restitution from their traffickers, new law enforcement tools to intercept trafficking, and the protection of victims' testimony. At the time of the passing of this bill, many called it a landmark bill in curbing sex trafficking in Nevada. Now, our discussion on this show is to explore the impact of a landmark bill after the fact. To join in this discussion, please welcome Melissa Holland, founder and executive director of Awaken, Samuel Martinez, chief deputy district attorney for Clark County, and Jason Frierson, speaker of our Nevada State Assembly. Well, Melissa, Sam, Speaker Frierson, thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to give a special thank you to our viewership as well for being here during a, a very trying week with what we've seen happening in Washington, D.C. and other government buildings throughout the United States. And our hope for this show is that focusing on bipartisan support through a landmark bill that has passed through our legislation can be somewhat uplifting in a, a very trying time. Uh, Speaker Fryson, I wanted to go to you first and let's talk exactly about that landmark bill that was uh, said a lot when the bill passed in 2013. If you can give us an idea of what the meaning is from a legislative perspective on what a landmark bill is and maybe why AB 67 is a good example of that. Well, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, AB 67 is a bill that I was proud to have been able to shepherd through um, at the, at the, with the leadership of Attorney General, then Attorney General Catherine Cortez Masto. Uh, I, I think that Nevada is a very unique uh, state with respect to our existing statutory scheme that might make it much more tempting uh, for folks to, to victimize people with respect to human trafficking. So uh, I think it was a landmark not only uh, within our state, but I think uh, in the country, uh, a sweeping change to how we look at uh, sex trafficking in particular and how we treat victims that uh, have been subjected to it. Uh, so, so uh, um, uh, Attorney General Cortez Masto, then Attorney General, was 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 very was very passionate about wanting to advance this le legislation to make sure that Nevada was not on the map of of states that welcomed that kind of activity, especially when we recognize that Southern California, in particular Compton, California, where I was born and raised, has become a hub. For human trafficking um, that's just some 500 miles away and i think um, it was important that we made that statement um, given all the dynamics of our state so uh, st so making the statement is is very very important of course melissa i want to talk about the the victim side of this of course um, victim services and how the bill potentially could have could have changed or, or been groundbreaking in that in that stage and then of course the victims themselves you give us a little bit more perspective there yeah, I appreciate the use of the word groundbreaking because it really did describe what that bill was doing and the effect that it's had since then. There's certainly been a ripple effect, but you know, prior to to Senator Masto's, you know, previously Attorney General Masto, there wasn't even a, a law in Nevada for sex trafficking specifically. We didn't even come close to the federal statutes on it. It was just pimping and pandering, and so we never had victims that were willing to to do anything to trust the system of justice because the, the system had really failed them prior to that. Hmm. And Sam, let's talk about the law enforcement side of this. Of course, a lot of the provisions in the original bill were, were focused on law enforcement. Uh, and I'm sure you've had a chance to go back and look at the original draft in 2013 and what the language was in that bill. What stands out to you as far as new ground that was covered in that bill? Well, I, I think the potential penalties that were involved with 
the passing of the legislation was was very important when it comes to prosecuting these cases, when it comes to trying to resolve these cases. Uh, it, it required sex offender registration on human traffickers, which wasn't in the law before. And uh, the, the penalties were are, are much more severe. And uh, I think uh, it was groundbreaking as well. It created not only so much public awareness, but also awareness in the judiciary from my perspective when it comes to setting bail, when it comes to sentencing, when it comes to uh, hearing victims testify at preliminary hearings and, and things of that nature, I, I, I think it was groundbreaking. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And, and Speaker Farson, let's talk more about that, the, the public awareness side of this. Um, it, just, just to Melissa's point, uh, part of the bill is to finally establish the crime of sex trafficking. We look at that now and we think that almost sounds unheard of that that was first implemented in 2013. Obviously, that shows a huge paradigm that has changed. I mean, is, is, is that a big part of a initial introductory bill like this? No, I think it's a huge part of, of of an effort like this, and we still have work to do. Don't you know? I, I don't want anybody to think that our work is done. We still have work to do. Uh, even most recently, we attempted to pass legislation dealing with uh, hotlines uh, for victims to uh, to call in. But you see now, I think as a result of the momentum that, uh, quite frankly, I believe. Uh, if not started, really took off. And, and uh, after our 2013 effort, you see you see hotlines in the airport, in bathrooms, and in, in cabs. Um, but I think most importantly is uh, you, you see looking at victims of, of trafficking differently. And so one of the questions that we had in 2013 was, if you have two 16-year-old runs, um, if one of them is, 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 is better with money and they're homeless or in the streets, is that person a victim or a panderer. Um, and, uh, you know, I think those were the tough conversations that we had to have to make it very clear these are victims. And these these folks mm -hmm. have, you know, didn't start out when they were 16. And so there there are things that I think society did not handle that let them down, them to go further down that, that road. And I think getting law enforcement and the judiciary uh, uh, and, and prosecutor buy-in that we're talking about victims here, uh, I think, uh, you know, really was a big change in direction. I also agree that the penalties were, were significant and, and uh, usually we have penalties and there's a concern that this doesn't really, um, uh, you know, reduce crime. Uh, this isn't something that somebody thinks about when they're thinking about whether or not they want to come to Nevada. I think with this legislation and with the effort since then, this really does start the process of creating a less tempting environment uh, in Nevada because there's a, m a much more significant penalty. Um, in particular, I think the, the, the civil penalty uh, that we attached with taking away somebody's motivation to live off the earnings of, of is, is, is a, you know, you know, homeless or victimized otherwise in trafficking, I think are, are, are significant moves that have changed the conversation both in policymaking as well as in the criminal justice system. We'll talk about that civil part in just a second. Sam, I wanted to come back to you and talk about something that Speaker Farson was saying there uh, about how victims are regarded and going back to something you originally said, just how uh, viewpoints change a little bit. Uh, in your experience, both in the, the district attorney's office, but also within the judiciary system, how has the, the term victim of sex trafficking changed um, since 2013? Well, I, what I've noticed as, as a prosecutor um, and like I said before about the awareness in the judiciary about how important this bill was when it was passed, uh, when victims have the courage and the strength to get up on the stand and, and testify, it's, it's very empowering to them. It's, it's frightening, it's, it's scary, and it's, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. But when, when you see them on the stand testifying in front of their trafficker, and and testify to, to what happened to them and then to see their trafficker in custody for what he did to to the victim um, is has been a big change I, I think in, in in what we've been trying to accomplish how about how about the flip side of that we can talk specifically about this bill but we could talk about other bills that have passed since of victims that potentially do not want to confront their traffickers that are very frightened to do that are there provisions we have in place to be able to support those types of victims as well 
there, there are some uh, protections uh, for it, that, that were written in the law for children under the age of, of 16. Um, the detectives would be able to testify uh, to what the victim told the detective what happened in, in the crime. Um, we don't have as much of that protection on the adult side of things because uh, there is the confrontation rights that defendants have to face their accusers. Um, but but we we go forward with it and and uh, the best that we can and and try to encourage the victims to come forward and, and testify. So we talked about the courage involved in, in, in victims here, and we want to talk about the, the, that same courage of going forward um, and testifying in a legislative session about a potential bill like this. We do have a clip to show. This clip is from the documentary, The Zen Speaker. Uh, it features and chronicles Amy Ayub's life, who testified for AB67. Let's take a look at that clip. I had been working on it, a comprehensive bill to address uh, sex trafficking in this state. I had been going around the state talking about it, talking to anybody who was willing to listen from the faith-based community, the advocates, to the law enforcement, prosecutors, you name it. And Amy found out about it. There was the call that she said, I wanna, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. She said, let's, can we go have breakfast? I told her my story and she was fabulous, of course, and said that she, that it was my story. She would not tell it but that she would keep me informed of what the office was doing on the subject. And if I wanted to participate, I could, and if I didn't, be fine. Her office called and said that they were gonna, the bill was gonna come before the legislature a lot sooner than they thought. They thought it was gonna be towards the end, but that they wanted to hear it within two, it was gonna be within the next two weeks and would I testify with Catherine? And I said, I'm gonna say yes <laughs> before, <laughs> just to commit. and. So I said yes, and then I was petrified. There's things I wish I didn't do in my life. I have ne not spoken about this for 38 years. So the shame is obviously unspeakable. But the one regret that I really have is never getting to look that pimp in the eye and say, I'm not afraid of you anymore. And to help any girl be able to look the pimp in the eye and say that to testify, to make sure that they have to take the punishment that's due them. No matter what the outcome is actually, it's just to let them have that say, to support them in saying that is the biggest gift you can give and will make the biggest change. A wonderful clip. Uh, if you want to watch the Zen Speaker in its entirety, public, uh, Vegas PBS is going to air that documentary on this channel, Channel 10, uh, that will air on Tuesday, January 12th at 10 p.m. You can also uh, stream uh, that documentary uh, after January 15th. Um, Sam, to, to your point there, I, you, she talked exactly about what you're talking about, being able to face um, your trafficker. Uh, I want to talk more about community voice and public voice and how important that is to this conversation, Melissa. Um, Amy was one of many that testified. Uh, Awaken was also um, a supporter of this bill. Can you talk specifically about from the community-based um, nonprofit sector here, how important it is to testify to move a bill like this forward? Yeah, this was actually the first time I had ever testified for legislation. And just to be transparent, you know, I was new to the nonprofit world prior to Awaken. This was my first experience to enter into um, working with an NGO in this capacity. And uh, when Senator Masto approached us to, to testify, I honestly didn't even understand the connection at the time. And then starting this process it is definitely changed the way we even we the way we are as a nonprofit because we've seen the value, not just for us, but for other survivors to also have their voice heard, whether it be through their own or through us, when they allow us testimony to share in legislative hearings to try to advocate for good, healthy legislation. Speaker Frierson, you were the chair of that Judiciary Committee at that time. You were present during that testimony. Speak more to that, uh, the, the impact uh, of testimony like that in a, a legislative session. 
Well, <clears throat> look, I, I wasn't prepared. Uh, I, I wasn't aware that that Amy was going to uh, I, I heard her, her experience, let alone that she was going to share that experience. Uh, but as chair of that committee, um, I think it's it's our obligation to create a safe place. And so I immediately um, uh, realized the need to make sure that uh, Amy was 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 safe to, to tell her story. Uh, and it was it was it was very impactful uh, it, you could hear a pin drop in the room. And uh, I think uh, it it's it personalized it in a way that I, I don't think may have happened otherwise. I think it took away the stigma. It took away, I think, stereotypes. Uh, you know, the, Amy has been around and this this, you know, this body knows her advocacy efforts from other you know, efforts uh, with respect to public speaking. And so for, I think, the body to hear, this is not just theoretical, but this is real. And you know someone personally who's been through it, uh, I, I think changed uh, the tone of the conversation. And so, you know, there were provisions in there. And you asked earlier about uh, victims coming forward. Well, I think as a result of that, one of the provisions that was left in there was a presumption that a depot was appropriate a deposition is appropriate and necessary for those victims who are comfortable uh coming forward publicly um and these were things that may have had some um opposition before there was a personal effort to describe uh what actually happens and have it be told by somebody who uh many members of the legislature knew personally hmm. sam let's talk more about uh what what else has changed uh since the bill's been in place let's let's look at kind of where we are now and i think the most obvious assumption is is that a bill like this might curb uh, sex trafficking in a place maybe like Clark County. Uh, do we have evidence that shows that? I, in my experience, I've been in this position uh, since 2016, and there's there's still a significant amount of human trafficking that is taking place in in this county. Unfortunately, um, I. I, I can't speak to how much of a deterrent the law is, but I can speak to how much more severe the penalties are and the leverage that we have when we're trying to resolve these cases or, or taking them to, to trial. Um, and going to Speaker Frierson's point, um, when, when you hear a victim and when a jury hears a victim testify to the horrific things that happened to them by their trafficker, um, you can hear a pin drop. And when judges hear that at, at preliminary hearings, you, you can hear it. Um, so what I, what I think is, has changed is, is not the number of cases so much, because I think that's, that's remained pretty much the same, but the amount of prison time or, or the punishment and the sex offender registration requirements, um, I, I think pre prevent future trafficking from these traffickers. I want to talk a little bit to Sam just about the, the language of what a trafficker is. Uh, you know, th there was opposition originally to the bill. There's been opposition in, in revisions to the bill since about uh, the, the language of what a trafficker is or is not. In your world, uh, aside from what happens in legislation, how does the interpretation of what a trafficker is evolve or change throughout the years? Has it? I think I think with the passage of of this law, uh, I, I mean, most of the time they're 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 referred to as pimps. I think with the passage of this law, I, I think it's more accurate to define them as human traffickers or sex traffickers, um, and, and I think that has an impact. Uh, you know, I'll 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 read transcripts of interviews that detectives have with suspects. Uh, with traffickers and when they tell them what the charges are that they're arrested for when they say sex trafficking you can you can see on the transcript or you can hear on the audio it's just their 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 fear that they're being charged with with such a crime and and I think it it really hits home so Melissa I wanted to come to you too and let's talk about some of the changes in in victim advocacy or victim services here and it seems like the theme we've been talking about a lot here is victims that are coming forward maybe you could speak a little bit to are you seeing a change in the number of victims that are seeking services uh, that awaken provides yeah we each year we see an increase in victims that are looking for services um, in 2020 we had our highest numbers yet it was 173 victims just in our community that awaken was able to, to offer services and help to 
Um, in my opinion, and, and, and according to research, you know, the data is going to show kind of what your question to, to Sam was in terms of the rates of human trafficking in our state. The, the two components that are absolutely necessary to address and curb the, the issue of human trafficking anywhere are going to be, one, you cannot have a legalized sex trade if you want to reduce human trafficking. Unfortunately, we are a sex tourism state. We are number one in the nation in, in the sex trade. The rates of a sex trade were 63% higher than the next highest state. It's astronomical and it's inexcusable. And so the reason, you know, the reference to AB 67 is groundbreaking is because it was just a beginning. We are now 50 years into a legal sex trade in our state and the numbers and the data prove it to be harmful. It's incredibly harmful to women. It's harmful to men. And so the second thing you have to address is you also have to go after the other prong of human trafficking, which is the buyer. So we can continue to arrest traffickers day in and day out, but until the, in, the penalties increase towards buyers, they will continue to come to our state to commodify women for the purchase of sex. And that is what happens every single day in our communities. So all the, the victims we work with, they know that. Buyers are there for one thing, to have their fantasy fulfilled. That is the only thing they're paying for. They're not interested in figuring out if this person is a victim or not. So it's indistinguishable to a buyer. They simply want their fantasy fulfilled. And, and Speaker Fryson, I, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. I know you're not the chair of the Judiciary Committee, but that was something that was in AB 67 originally, is looking at buyers and potentially putting penalties similar to traffickers within that bill. Is that something that is being discussed or you have seen has come up at all uh, in potential future legislation we could see? I think that it has to be a part of the conversation uh, from, a, from a judiciary perspective, um, I, I think that the committee is always aware of the differences between specific intent crimes and general intent crimes. And, and so when you have, for example, statutory sexual assault, that's a general intent. You don't have to know that the, the victim is underage for you to be liable and culpable criminally. And so I think that, that 2013 started a conversation about that very thing, about whether or not there's uh, knowledge and whether or not that matters. Um, I do think that uh, in a state where where uh, the, the sex trade is, is is lawful in some parts of the state, it, it certainly makes it complicated. And I think there were legislators that um, don't necessarily or did not then necessarily understand the impact that the trade and that the practice of trafficking has uh, in the state and on victims. Um, that I am hopeful um, is increasingly, uh, you know, educated to members so that we can do right by it. It's a broad conversation. Um, that I think we have to continue to have. Uh, again, I think Amy Ayub's uh, personal story was very impactful and, and was helpful in, in delivering that story um, in a way that folks, you know, were not uh, caught in their own stereotypes about um, who gets caught up in, 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 in this activity. Um, so I think that we do have to continue to have a conversation about um, uh, to what extent uh, this is similar to statutory sex in dealing with underage victims um, and to what extent you need to to, to know, or maybe you should just be aware that if you are going to pay for sex, that there is uh, a chance that the person who you are engaging with is a victim and is not there by their own, own, own choice. We did include some provisions in AB 67 that I believe try to um, deal with the sex trade and deal with uh, the folks that maybe appear to be voluntarily engaging in it, but uh, but but likely are not. And I just think we have to continue to have those conversations. Uh, I do believe that that uh, AB 67 was a huge, huge step, mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond uh, uh, the, the penalties as far as criminal uh, culpability. I mean, we're not talking just about the resources that somebody has generated based on victimizing, but we are talking about making that victim whole. We th there are provisions in AB 67 that make it clear you, you know, you, if you are convicted of trafficking, you may be on the hook for making sure that victim is made whole uh, with respect to where they live. Um, if they're from another country, being able to get them back home. And Sam, we got about 30 yeah. seconds left. I wanted to get your take on this too. Let's go back to uh, potentially um, uh, being able to charge, convict um, uh, users 
uh, at the same level as traffickers or, or potentially just you know that being part of what the pro prosecutors are doing in the district attorney's office. Uh, capacity to do something like that, uh, the judiciary system, do you see any problems or hangups there? Well, I, I, I think it's simple economics. If you get rid of the demand, then the supply is gonna go away. And uh, if, if there's a deterrent for sex buyers uh, where it becomes a felony, I think that will be a real deterrent. Um, I, I think there will be some pushback uh, from from different areas of, of the community, but um, I, 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 I honestly think that if, if you get rid of the demand, then the supply is gonna go away and, and I think trafficking would go way down. Well, Sam, Melissa, Speaker Frierson, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you as always for joining us this week. On Nevada Week. Now, if you or someone you know is potentially a victim of sex trafficking, please call our state hotline at 1 888 373 7888. You can also text that hotline. Also, if you'd like to watch the entire documentary that we featured on this show, The Zen Speaker, Vegas PBS is airing it on this channel on Tuesday, January 12th at 10 p.m. It will also be available to stream on the PBS video app and at video.vegaspbs.org on Friday, January 15th. Thanks again, appreciate it.